afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the LKY School. Uh, my name is Srikant Gupta. I'm a faculty here. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all to this public lecture by Mr. Gurcharan Das. Um, Mr. Das doesn't need much of an introduction, not just in India, but in most parts of the world. And to uh, describe him through his bio is, uh, I would think, rather inadequate, because he's a man of so many parts. Uh, philosopher, uh, CEO of a company, um, writer. I, I guess it's rather inadequate for me to even describe uh, Mr. Das, so I don't think I'll, I'll try. Uh, the talk that, uh, the lecture that Mr. Das is going to give us today uh, flows from the book uh, that's available outside and uh, he has also very graciously agreed to sign copies uh, if you would like. Uh, and it leads into um, a new venture that he has embarked on, a new book, uh, if you would want a sequel, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, called The Dharma of Capitalism, uh, which is uh, the title of this talk, but this talk flows from the book uh, that some of you have seen uh, called The Difficulty of Being Good. And uh, this, if you are aware, is also uh, the matter of a, a television uh, a, a con set of television conversations uh, between uh, Mr. Das uh, and uh, people, uh, eminent people in India. And he will also be speaking on Friday, so uh, he'll be speaking at the at the Kentridge campus of NUS, uh, which is on a different topic, which is actually uh, based on the book. And this is a lecture that really flows from the book. So again, as, as you've seen, it's very hard to, to, to classify or slot uh, Mr. Das. I also have a personal connection with him since he's chair of the Center for Civil Society, uh, of which I'm on the Board of Scholars, a think tank in, in Delhi. And uh, I've spent many years uh, reading and following with great interest uh, what he writes, uh, what he has to say, how he has to say it. And now it's indeed a great uh, uh, privilege and honor to uh, have uh, Mr. Das speak, please. Well, <clears throat> Srikant, thank you very much. Uh, and really, this is a very special place. Uh, uh, Lee Kuan Yew, yeah, I think I've got a mic here. Uh, you know, Lee Kuan Yew is a much admired figure, not just in Singapore, but in many parts of the world, a visionary leader of the 20th century. And uh, there are many in India who would have really uh, would have loved it if he had been a leader <laughs> in India. Uh, uh, and, uh, and still today, we could use we could use uh, Lee Kuan Yew's in India. You just, the, the whole, you know, you just have to be here for 10 minutes in Singapore to see the quality of governance that exists. And, and uh, India is really an amazing uh, place now because prosperity is spreading in India, and, uh, and it will. I mean, there's no question this 8% growth rate is, uh, is a base case, as business people say. And the power of compound interest with even 8% is so great that India will reach the US per capita income before 2050. So. There's no question that prosperity will spread, but unfortunately, governance is not spreading in the same way. And so until governance spreads, happiness will not spread in our society. And so we have a, a great deal to learn. And part of the failure of governance, really, is a moral failure. Um, and that's really what my book uh, is all about, uh, that it is about coping 
uh, with moral failure. Today, however, I'm going to talk about some of the lessons that my book and my thinking on moral, the moral dimension of life. My, my, uh, <clears throat> my university degree was in moral philosophy. And some of you may know the name John Rawls. He was my tutor. I wrote my thesis with John Rawls. And I was lucky he's perhaps the, the greatest uh, moral philosopher of the 20th uh, century. And I will also, by the way, when I was in college, I also did Sanskrit. And, uh, uh, and, and so I have gone back to my university enthusiasms because I have, act in this book, looked at the world through the lens of the 2,000-year-old epic, the Mahabharat. And today, I'm going to look at the problem of the global financial failure, the global economic failure that we see. And I'm going to try to see it from the lens again of the Mahabharat. What may seem to you like a very bizarre undertaking, but then I've never been short of ambition. <laughs> so, so those are the themes of this next 45 minutes. Um, I'll talk for till about five past one, and then we can have some question answers. Um, so I, we'll talk about global capitalism, we'll talk about insights from the Mahabharat, and we'll talk a little bit about the, the we'll talk about the moral dimension fun, primarily of, of the capitalist economy. Now a year ago, the world was unraveling. People predicted that this was the end of global capitalism, and some of you may remember that some very eminent people came together in Paris on January 17th of last year, just a year ago. And this was President Sarkozy of France, Prime Minister Tony Blair of England, and the German Chancellor Angela Merkel. And they kicked off a debate on the nature and future of capitalism. And now, just a year later, the doomsayers have turned out to be wrong. The world economy is reviving. Certainly, it is reviving very rapidly in India and China and other emerging markets who are at the forefront of the recovery. And the, in the rest of the world, it is somewhat slower but it will, it, you can see those green shoots, as they call them, over there as well. Now, governments do deserve a lot of credit. I, I am very sparing in giving credit to governments because I find they usually make more mistakes than they do good. But in this case, I think you have to give credit to the governments who seem to have learned the lessons of the Great Depression in the 1930s, and the way they expanded state support for their economies and buffered the damage. So in a sense, this talk is a contribution to that debate that was begun in, 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 in Paris. And as I was saying that the whole idea of a 2,000-year-old epic offering insights into capitalism's future is strange. But the truth is that the world of the Mahabharata, which is the, the epic I'm talking about, is it's a world of moral haziness, of lack of clarity. It is far closer to our day-to-day -day experience when we face that, and when we don't know clear answers on what we should do. Because 
moral questions are not like asking the names of the rivers of Asia, where there's a pretty clear answer. And so it's closer to our experience as human beings. And the world of the Mahabharat is also a very good counterpoint to the narrow and rigid positions that define debate in our fundamentalist times. There's far too much, far too many people today who feel they have a monopoly on the truth and they're willing to die for it. And the, the epic is a wonderful antidote because the characters in the epic are still looking for dharma at the very end of the epic from where they started. The most damaging fallout from this economic crisis may well be a loss of trust in the democratic capitalist system. If those who are unemployed and suffering begin to believe that anything goes in an unfair world, in the rush to rewrite the rules of the game, policymakers might consider the message of dharma from the epic Mahabharat as well as from other sources which discuss, which discuss dharma in Indian philosophy and literature. And as I mentioned, which are a more nuanced answer to moral failure and the ethics of capitalism. Now, dharma can mean virtue, duty, law, sometimes even religion, but it is mainly concerned with doing the right thing. And the Mahabharat is obsessed with this question. What is the right thing to do in a particular moment? So unlike, a, unlike the Greek epics where, for example, Achilles does something wrong. You know what he does to Hector. But then he gets on with it. In the Mahabharat, when Yudhishthir or Arjun does something wrong, the action stops and all the characters way in. The argumentative Indian takes over. And they say, oh, but that went wrong. Somebody, no, 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 I disagree. That is really what the wrong thing was. And so you have this 360 degree debate on what went wrong. And so what you have is a very high quality of moral reasoning that is embedded in the epic. And what, much to my surprise, because I did study moral philosophy at the university, I was very surprised that a lot of the ideas we associate with John Stuart Mill, utilitarianism, are the same ideas that Vidura talks about, the greatest good for the greatest number he talks about in the Mahabharat. He, you know, he's quite happy to say that, look, I will sacrifice a village for the sake of a nation or I'll sacrifice one person for the sake of a village. So you see, this is a question that constantly, I mean, would you torture a child to save 1,000 children? And so what you have here is that dharma, which is an obsession of the epic, is a sort of moral law that gives order to society and to the individual. It creates trust within society and it gives balance to the human life. And this concept is uniquely suited to guiding us, I believe, through our present day economic and regulatory quagmires because it is concerned with the achievable than the ideal. It recognizes that human 
happiness comes from upholding a certain balance by living according to a system of beliefs that restrains us and gives coherence to our desires. That our desires are always present. But what restrains those desires? What gives coherence to those desires? And what creates that sense of order to those desires is, 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 is dharma. It recognizes that happiness comes from upholding a certain balance. And dharma does not seek moral perfection as you find in Christianity or Islam or the religions of many other religions. Hence, it is pragmatic and Indian statesmen throughout history have turned to it to address issues of public policy. Now, so it's appropriate, Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, we should be talking about dharma. <clears throat> dharma is exemplified in a, in a little story. Story, actually, which is at the heart of the epic, where Queen Draupadi has been called to an assembly like this, only everybody present are nobles and kings, but then we are also nobles in our own way. We are noble in our own way. So she's called here because her side of in this conflict has been defeated in a rigged game of dice, believe it or not. And and she's been called to be humiliated. And she, um, it is in a patriarchal society. You hurt the men by going after their women. And uh, and of course, it's, it's been a dice, so let me just take a minute, because it's been a dice, a game of dice, in which her husband, Yudhishthira, has gambled, and the other side has cheated, and they've won in this gambling match. He is a, he's also a gambling addict. So, he gambles, everything he owns, he, then he gambles his kingdom, then he gambles his brothers, then he gambles himself, and then finally he gambles his wife. And when she's called to this assembly to be humiliated, she asks this question, who lost first? Tell me, was it my husband or me? And in this way, she stops the show because she is saying that if I, if my husband lost first, then he was not free anymore, and then he could not gamble me because he was unfree. So this is a very good legal point that she has caught the other people on. And of course, it's a great feminist moment because she's turned the tables on the opposition. But the bad guys are not going to be stopped by this legal method. And so they are determined to, and so one of them calls for disrobing her. And when he starts to disrobe her sari, the sari keeps growing and growing. And it keeps growing for half an hour. And then the poor people, exhausted, they sit down. And the question, of course, is that what happened? Why did the sari keep growing? And it kept growing because somebody says it was cosmic justice. She was a good woman. And, 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 and you know. Anyway, the long end, this is a famous scene. Every television 
every uh, movie you may, you may see, you may remember Peter Brook made a movie, the television serial. Every, this, in fact, they brought out a Dropdi collection of saris uh, on the Bombay market. And, but those saris did not expand forever. <laughs> anyway, the, the, the punishment for losing the battle, losing the dice game, is that her husband, is, husband and the whole family are exiled for 13 years. And so she goes, she, uh, they're in the jungle in exile, and she sees her husband sleeping on the hard earth. And she says, my Lord, my heart weeps to see you sleeping on this hard earth when you've been, you slept all your life on sheets of silk and pillows of goose down. They had goose down pillows, by the way, at that time. It's not just in Bloomingdale's or Nordstrom that you buy them. And so she basically says, you know, why did this happen to us? Here we were on top of the world. And she brings out the old question of unmerited suffering. And she basically tells her husband that let's go back, get an army, and win back our kingdom. I mean, she has a bias for action, like a good manager. And, uh, but her husband says that he has given his word. And, uh, and she says, but what's the point? What's the point of being good when, isn't it better to be powerful and rich than to be good in an unfair world where those who steal and cheat are the ones who live in, the palace, live in palaces and the ones who are good have to sleep in the jungle? So why be good? Now that is really the theme of the epic. And this question resonates and runs right through the epic. And her husband, Yudhishthir, replies in the only way that he knows. And he says to her, when she says, why be good? He says, I act because I must. And his answer represents the uncompromising, compelling voice of dharma. For him, good acts produce good karma, and these acts eventually change the balance of dharma in the universe. If people did not keep their commitments, he says, the social order and the rule of law would collapse, and therefore dharma is needed not only for a human being to live a happy, flourishing life, but also for society to maintain itself. Now, there were, let's leave the Mahabharat for a second. There were many dharma failures in the run-up to today's economic crisis, in which all the actors seem to have behaved rationally. When U.S. house prices were rising and interest rates were low, even the poor got a chance to get a mortgage and a home. Nothing wrong about that. Banks securitized these mortgages and sold these complex financial products to other financial institutions who also gained through better returns. When the housing market turned down, these financial markets turned toxic. So whom do you fault? Everybody was seemed to be doing his duty and following his self-interest. 
Now, dharma is very interesting in the Mahabharat, draws a fine line between the self-interest of human beings and the selfishness of human beings. Selfishness, what the newspapers call greed. And this is the same distinction that Adam Smith also drew in the theory of moral sentiments. He talked about the fact that we, you know, you wouldn't wake up in the morning if you were not self-interested. This is, by the way, Dropdi says this in the Mahabharata one time. If it rains outside, you carry an umbrella. Nothing selfish about that. It's just self-interested behavior. When you go to the market, you want to buy the best bananas at the cheapest price. Nothing selfish about that. It's just being self-interested, rational human beings. But there is a point when that self-interest that we, that which we do every day becomes selfishness when we hurt others. When somehow others' rights are get affected when we are being excessively self-interested. And that is really the fine line that the epic comes back to. And it's also the fine line that the Enlightenment philosophers of the 18th century, capitalism, Condorcet and Adam Smith and others, Hume, Hume talked about this uh, same point. So, coming back then to the financial crisis, dharma, if you look at it through dharma, dharma would judge all the actors in today's crisis guilty for tipping the balance of dharma in the wrong way. In the one hand, they were being self-interested. But think again, the undeserving recipient of the loan may have misjudged his or her ability to pay. That's a nice way to put it, when they knew that they would never be able to pay that loan, and they still took the loan. Or the person offering the loan, the banker, who was offering the loan, or Fannie Mae, Freddie Mae, all those institutions, they knew that they could, these loans could not be paid. Then the banker, motivated by short-term rewards, pushed the subprime mortgages to shaky borrowers without doing sufficient due diligence. The rating agencies underestimated the riskiness of the assets. Again, a nice way to put the fact that they didn't do their job. And they were too pleased, too willing to please their, the bankers and their customers. Then the institution that bought those risky assets failed to protect their shareholders. They didn't do their job. And finally, regulators were also captured by interests when they acted. And it was from often for us living here in the East, they were acting purely from domestic compulsions, forgetting the global consequences, that these were global institutions that they were regulating. Citibank, Merrill Lynch, uh, Bank of America, and so on. The, the Mahabharat has another interesting comment. It says that human beings are fundamentally flawed and their faults make the world uneven. The word it uses is vishama. As a result of this unevenness and the flaws of the world, we are all subject to nasty surprises. We are vulnerable. 
the chief purveyor of the nasty surprises in the epic, of course, is the villain Duryodhan. But the other characters too. The gambler, Yudhishthir, who I mentioned a few minutes ago. There's Karna, who suffers from status anxiety. There's Ashwatthama, he's filled with revenge. There's Dhritra the king, Dhritarashtra, who is too prone to excessive love for his eldest son. He's blinded by it. Anyway, it is these human defects that drive the epic towards calamity. And so, like the Mahabharat's characters, investment bankers on Wall Street, the rating agencies and the regulators suffer from similar failings. And it is these dangerous infirmities that brought the global capitalist system to its knees in the beginning of 2008. John Maynard Keynes, the great economist, had a similar insight as the Mahabharat about our uneven world. He lived during the Great Depression when there were many calls to end capitalism. The unevenness of the world is caused, he said, by uncertainty in the markets because we don't have full knowledge of what's going on. The actors in the markets don't have full knowledge. And also, the actors in the market are, are driven by animal spirits. And these, uh, you've heard this expression, uh, these animal spirits which drive businessmen to take risks, often in the face of insufficient knowledge, is what causes this unevenness of the world. Some of you may have seen the movie, The Beautiful Mind, about uh, John Nash, the wonderful Nobel Prize winning hero. He traced this uncertainty to asymmetries of information. And this, uh, this lack of full knowledge is what leads to crises. You will remember the dot-com bubble at the turn of the century in which many sensible young people, many people we all know, who quit their jobs and they, want, they left to make a fortune. Well, that bubble burst in 2000, but five years later, it was replaced by another mania of the smart flippers of securitized mortgages of subprime properties, which sent the world into a recession in 2007. Now, Keynes believed that capitalism, that the capitalist economy left to itself is unstable and needs state regulation. You know, standard economic theory that we all learned in school and college, I mean, I'm not a, an economist, but I consider myself an economically literate writer. And standard economic theory, which we read in college, ignores the world's vishama, the unevenness of the world, this uncertainty which is brought about by human passions and animal spirits. Ever since Adam Smith, classical economics has assumed that capitalism is inherently stable, that people buy and sell rationally, and this results in equilibrium. It forgets that people get into manias, and even panwalas start buying shares. Panwalas, you all know panwalas. Buying shares on the basis of rumors. When manias take over, they are bubbles, and when bubbles are pricked, Confidence falls sharply and the whole economy collapses. 
Hence, we do need regulation to protect people from themselves, to ensure they are not falsely lured into buying bad assets. But this regulation must not kill the animal spirits of entrepreneurs, which is what happened in India during the ugly days of the license Raj. Forty long years. Forty long years. So the word, we are very frightened when the government starts talking about regulation, unlike you here in Singapore. We almost lost two generations from that. Now, if Keynes thought that the answer lies, let me get up. If Keynes thought that if the answer lies in regulation, the Mabharat thinks that you can even out the world through dharma. And dharma recognizes that human beings want more. We always want more. And dharma, I realize this by the way, because I have a two-year-old grandchild. And I, I've been playing with him in the last couple of days that I came to Singapore. And the one thing I notice about him is that he always wants more. Now, dharma seeks to give coherence to our desires by containing them, as I said earlier, with an or, within an ordered existence. So no amount of regulation that Keynes may want will catch all the crooks. You know, you won't catch all the Duryodhans, the Bernie Madoffs, the Ramalingam Rajus. They will always be there. Therefore, what you do need is not just regulation. Dharma, by the way, also means regulation. But dharma also means restraint, the human restraint that we all. It's very hard to tell my grandson about restraint at this point. But there is, by the way, in children, a certain sense of restraint. And you, some of you may have read Jean Piaget, the Swiss psychologist, who did these wonderful experiments. And I remember in one experiment, he, had, he went to a birthday party, and he gave a cake of equal size, very carefully cut, to all the children in the birthday party. But to one child, he gave double the size. Every child was offended, including the child who got double the size. So you see, the notion of dharma, whether you call it distributive justice in this case, comes very early. After all, that's a restraint, a sense you always want more. And so the child who got double, you would have thought, would have been very happy. He got more, but he was not. He was upset. So children, when we are children, we acquire this. I don't know how we acquire it, but we acquire it even at the age of three, this notion of dharma. So as I was saying, that no amount of regulation will catch all the crooks. Ultimately, our life, our world, the capitalist markets, requires restraint on the part of, of the actors. And this is the restraint that builds trust within society, which makes us feel that when we sell something to somebody, they give us a check, and that, that we believe the check will not bounce. That's the trust that we have. Or when we buy bananas, and the banana seller says, these are great bananas. And so we're willing to pay a little extra. It 
the trust. But if, because if he did not deliver those bananas, we would go to the next banana seller. So he would get punished very quickly by the market. So there is that moral underlying morality of the market. Anyway, I think the sunny world of Adam Smith may have been a tad optimistic. But Smith understood the importance of trust, which, which underlies every transaction in the marketplace. And therefore, this self-restraint that I talked about and the trust that it creates is what I call the dharma of capitalism. Now, regulators and central bankers today around the world are wrestling with how to reform the financial systems. They're expanding huge debates are taking place in the world between the political left and the political right. When the real divide is between conduct in accordance with dharma and adharma, between the right and the wrong. Nobody asks that question in these great debates that are taking place uh, in the world. And nobody really asks this question that sure, our job, they're saying, the regulator saying, is to catch the crooks. But nobody says, but shouldn't we also reward good behavior? That somebody who really does something compassionate or does something that becomes a model for us all. You know, there's a wonderful moment in the Mahabharata at the end of the epic when the hero, Yudhishthir, is going up to heaven. And a stray dog attaches itself to him on the way. And they keep walking up to heaven. They don't look at each other. They just look straight. And on they go. And they reach heaven. And out comes the heaven keeper, the, go the Lord Indra. And Indra says to Yudhishthir, welcome, great king. We have been waiting for you. And Yudhishthir, instead of going into heaven, says, but what about this dog? And Indra says, what about this dog? He's not even your dog. He's just a stray street dog. He's dirty. We can't have him in heaven. Dog's not allowed. And Yudhishthir says something quite amazing. He says, what kind of a place is heaven? He says, I grew up being told that if somebody comes to you for refuge, you help them. And he, then he says, I don't want to go into heaven. And he refuses to go in. Now, Nobody in here would have done what Yudhishthira did. But every child in every culture will understand dharma from this story. <coughs> and that's why, you know, I've, 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 I'm almost on a, on a campaign to teach the Mahabharata in our schools. Because this is how children learn restraints. Children learn ideals moral ideals. And I mean, I don't know in Singapore what you, whether you learn in, as children, whether you learn this sort of thing. But um, the Mahabharata certainly thinks that children should be taught uh, <coughs> these, these kinds of things. So as I was saying, that institutions must reward good behavior. And certainly, the Mahabharata believes that one good act is worth, is more valuable than almost anything on this earth. And it believes that we are all in the gutter, looking, but some of us are looking at the stars. And so, 
the Mahabharat believes that a life lived according to dharma diminishes this vulnerability of human beings and evens out, removes some of the unevenness of the world. Um, unevenness of the world. So a few minutes left. And let me just say that, you know, I wrote, uh, before I wrote this book, I wrote a book called India Unbound. And in India Unbound, I came to this optimistic conclusion that prosperity would spread in India as it is spreading in China and other places. And India would become economically just like the, 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 the successful countries in the Far East. Uh, and uh, really, frankly, nothing can stop that path. That, that no ruler, basically, no politician can destroy that growth rate because the genie has come out of the bottle. The reforms have taken place. And I was concerned after that with, about governance. And it is governance failures uh, that drove me to this book. Um, and by governance failures, I do not mean a politician being caught with a bribe, Madhu Koda, the latest example. Um, I mean the day-to-day -day interaction of the citizen with the state, whether you have to get a driver's license renewed, you know, do you pay a bribe or not, whether you want the title on your property changed when your father dies, do you pay a bribe or not to get that done, and so on and so forth. And the poor are the worst victims of this. Uh, because the, the, the rich can get around these services somehow, either by bribing or some way. But the poor suffer. And so I turned to the Mahabharat. And why I turned to the Mahabharat epic is because, one, the Mahabharat is unique in the world of literature in engaging with the world of politics. And there's a lot in the Mahabharata about the dharma of the king. The second, and of course, remember that moment in the, when Draupadi comes to this assembly, which I told you about. She raises this question. What is the dharma of the ruler? Are you going to allow this to happen? She shames everybody. She shames. That's why she's become some kind of a feminist heroine today. She shames all the men in the assembly. So the second reason for, of course, is that the Mahabharata is obsessed with doing the right thing with dharma. A third reason is that in the Mahabharata, nobody turns to God to ask, where does dharma Who's the authority on dharma? You know, they keep getting into moral conflicts all the time, all the time. Uh, one of the conflicts that occurs, and this is, uh, happens again and again, but one of the times is, of course, that it's a question, really, of Yudhishthir constantly saying, well, it's, I'm doing this because it's my duty. And Draupadi is saying, but if you do your duty, the world will be worse off. So how do you judge dharma? He says, if you are honest all the time, but you're hurting other people. You know, the, the, it's very interesting. When I was writing this epic and I read this, uh, this that day in the Times of India, they, it reported about uh, incident that happened in Goa and a child was drowning on the beach in Goa and a young man jumped into the sea and saved this child and so the reporter of Times of India went to this young man and said you're a hero why did you do it and he sheepishly confessed 
that he had come to Goa with his friends from Hindu college in Delhi with a group. And he said that I was trying to impress one of the girls in our <laughs> college party. And the reporter then said to her, but then you are not a hero. But Vidura would have said, Ma Vidura, this character in Mahabharat, would have said, but the child was saved. The moral deed was done. He is a hero. What difference does it make what his motive was? But he says, but Yudhishthir, of course, would have jumped in if, even if nobody was looking. Right? Now, these are the kind of moral dilemmas. Do you judge a moral action from its consequences, that it saved the child? Or do you judge it from the motivation of the actor, that he was trying to impress his girlfriend? And this comes up again and again in the epic. And what this does, actually, is it improves our moral reasoning. And moral, good moral reasoning is behind good moral action. Good moral. So this epic, reading the epic and spending time figuring out right from wrong over the last six years, believe it or not, I feel I have gotten no better in terms of being a moral human being. But what it has done is it has made me sensitive, more sensitive to the moral nature of our lives, and made me more sensitive to the role of dharma uh, in our lives. And so when the newspapers write every day, they'll come out with this tag. You know the story of Satyam and the Ramalingam Raju stole 7,000 crores from this company. And what did the newspapers say? Newspapers called it greed. And I said, uh-uh, no. What had happened here was the failing not of Duryodhan and his greed in the Mahabharat, but the failure of Dhritarashtra, meaning that Ramalingam Raju realized that the family's stake in Satyam had dropped to 7-8%. And pretty much they were going to lose this company. He certainly was not going to ensure succession for his sons to be CEOs of Satyam when private equity players and professionals had come in. And so what does he say? I want to leave a company for each of my sons. And he steals from the main company and puts the money into the two the infrastructure and the real estate company and gets into trouble. And so this is this kind of thinking really makes you realize. Now we all want to do good for our children, we do, all of us. But at what point does it stop? Would you steal for the sake of your son so that he can have a company? Most of us would think that's pretty ridiculous. You know, you feel okay, maybe you should leave them, give them a good education. We all agree with that. But you leave them a house. What do you give? Do you give your son or daughter a car on graduation? People do that. These are the issues that the Mahabharat raises, you see. Where do you stop? What is that restraint? What is the balance? What's that line constantly challenging us? OK, well, let me leave us with, with, with that, because I could go on and on. And maybe we should have some. Uh, uh, let's hear from you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, just two ground rules, since this is also being taped. Uh, please speak into the mic if you are close to one, and please identify yourself. Yeah. Hi, 
Hi, this is Malvika. I'm a research fellow with the NUS. I have a question. A couple of years ago, um, some uh, uh, people from Britain and the US were looking at uh, progress in Bhutan. And they said, yes, it's doing well. But the economic progress there is slow. To which the king, uh, the king of Bhutan, uh, Wan Chuk, I think his name was, said, um, yes, in terms of gross nat national product, we may be a little behind. But in terms of gross national happiness, we are quite so my question is, um, what is your opinion on um, using economic prosperity as, you know, these days as a sort of single obs uh, metric, obsessively using that as a single metric of well-being? Yeah. I think it's a very, very good question. And certainly, uh, it is a question of dharma as, as well. And, and uh, very quickly, uh, if you are very poor and starving, then economic prosperity is almost a moral imperative for society. And so, uh, for a poor country, I think it's very appropriate to use gross domestic product as a symbol of, uh, of, of, of well-being in society. It's almost uh, immoral not to do so. But as, but as you know, once you cross a certain threshold of prosperity in your society, then additional wealth that you acquire has a very marginal increase in your happiness. So the richer you get, the more food you receive is not going to make much difference to you. And therefore, other things come in, and certainly other indicators. And, so, and also, you, you know, I, the concern I had was that that's, you, you, you've got your, a starving person has food, then you want other things, and certainly um, we expect the state to deliver certain things. We expect the state to deliver law and order. We expect the state, even in capitalism, you need contracts to be enforced. So you need a judiciary, you need police. And so you need governance. And then as you move on to other, other, uh, other needs, etc. So I guess it's a function of where you are placed. And I'm not sure Bhutan, uh, uh, Bhutan uh, if Bhutan has conquered poverty, I would say that uh, uh, Bhutan certainly should measure uh, gross domestic happiness. Uh, but my, the subtext of your question is, in fact, that Bhutan has not conquered poverty, but yet Bhutan feels that happiness is more important and measured by other things. So what you're saying is that the poor also want other things at the same time, besides prosperity. And uh, these are, I mean, some, we, can, we can debate these. We can debate these things. Uh, uh, but you know, I fear. I think you're right. I think the poor do want other things. We all want justice. We all want harmony, peace, whether we are rich or poor. But I don't want us to get the policy makers off the hook as far as creating the basic economic foundation of a society by this way. That's my fear. And that's why I would still come back to gross domestic product as an important indicator to measure, uh, measure uh, well-being. Uh, yes, sir. Uh. Sir. If I were if to I pick yourself. up, uh, my name is uh, Dr. Gupta. I am just a visitor here. If I were to pick up three words out of your beautiful talk, I would pick up dharma, restraint, and regulation. Out of those three, it seems to me restraint is the crucial thing because dharma means self-restraint, yeah. it seems to me, and regulation means imposed restraint. Yeah. So what is the question? Now, 
nobody will dispute that self restraint is better than imposed restraint but fortunately or unfortunately in this real world most of the people are like your grandson we want more how do you reconcile this dharma with this we want more yeah and so therefore you need both i mean uh you we need to be able to teach my grandson in school uh restraint through stories like your sister dog and doing things for others also but we do need dharma also means law by the way it's a very confusing it's a very frustrating word unfortunately <laughs> you know i mean it drives you crazy because uh it encompasses all these things but clearly you need both you need both uh there will always be crooks in society uh, okay um we have lots of questions I'm going to collect them in uh, groups of three. Yes, the gentleman at the back, uh, then the gentleman in the blue shirt, and then the lady with her hand, and then in the next lot you. Uh, please, uh, uh, please introduce yourself and do speak into the mic. Uh, good afternoon, sir. My name is Tishampati Sen. I'm doing my LLM in corporate finance here at NUS. Uh, you talked about the financial system, sir, and how to look at the whole world in the with the prism of the Mahabharat. Uh, but there is this one portion in the bhagavad gita which talks about karmanya adhivya karaste mahaphalesha kadachana which basically talks about doing something without looking for the fruits of the action now in this financial situation where investments is all about looking for the fruits how far do you think we can really go back to the mahabharat and still have india and china growing the way they are thank you i am raman and i am pursuing public policy in the school here and my curiosity is why you chose mahabharat to explore morals because it's a story where a woman has five husbands illegitimate children gambling kings and a lot of devious help uh, i believe that we have some more myths mythological stories in india such as the ramayana bhagavata and uh, of course kautilya's arthashastra is uh, treated as a treatise in this world today mahabharat being unique in its political overtones is also uh and concept that i would like you to explain because the kings the dharma of the king the kings in mahabharat seem more like they were confused because they were looking for advice from all quarters they took right. advice from all quarters and finally does mahabharat really explore the right thing or does it explore the word that singapore mostly likes which is the pragmatic thing uh whether it accepts correct action or does it look for logical action very good very good question uh, one more question the lady here and then uh, we'll give these three to gurcharan and uh, then take the next round thank you um hello sir i'm a lawyer um and um i constantly face these moral questions every day and then i i have to confess this that i have been reading bhagavad gita from past 7 years to resolve these issues which i constantly face uh, and I, and i think that every corresponding right has a corresponding duty to it i i have always been following a uh, corva side of mahabharata when i'm negotiating the contracts because my duty lies in protecting the institution i'm serving so um but somehow i do i do face this dilemma every time i have to review a contract where the other party asked me that what is fair is which is what is mutual so please uh, guide me when i try to justify every action of mine just on this ground what bishma said that my duty lies to serve the nation i belong to so my duty lies to serve the institution who's paying for my salary okay very very difficult question okay my Good god time. no free lunch <laughs> we could we could spend the whole afternoon on these three questions they are so i think these are some of the best questions i've ever had and i've talked to so many audiences now about the book okay nishkam karma you talked about and nishkam karma as he very rightly said is to act for the sake of the action and not for the reward the personal reward and in other words um and i raise this question in chapter 5 of my book in fact the whole chapter 5 is an attempt 
to answer this very fine question uh, that can human beings act in such a way that they don't care who gets the credit for their actions. And uh, is this idea something that we can actually, we can behave like this? And can we do it on a sustained basis in the world? Or is this just as idealistic as Marx's notion of e equality? You know, will the human ego shrink that far? That's the question. Will the human ego shrink that far when you don't care who gets the credit for your actions? And um, you know, there are times, for example, when we seem to act like that. It's self-forgetting. We forget ourselves. Uh, when we are absorbed in our work, we say, oh my god, it's 6 o'clock. I thought it was only 4 o'clock. For two hours, your self had disappeared. You had forgotten yourself. So we have all experienced self-forgetting. But can we do it in a sustained way? I mean, you know, artists, scientists sometimes work for days together without thinking. We, they forget to have lunch, they forget to have dinner, and they'll keep working. Athletes, athletes, I mean, the other day Tendulkar hit a century and somebody asked him, you know, how was, did you feel when you were absolutely, in, you know, when you were approaching your century? And he said the ball had got so big by then that I had to hit it. There was no way that I could not hit it. And they, they call it, athlete, athletes call this being in the zone. So athletes experience it, scientists, we've all somehow experienced it. But frankly, can the distribution manager in my company behave like that? I mean, every CEO, CEO would love his employees to act in this selfless way. And even the Mahabharat, you know, he asks Arjuna, when he's shooting at the, at the target, what does he see? He sees nothing except the eye of the bird, whereas everybody else is seeing the tree, the bird, the plumes, and all that. So, but the question really is, first of all, I must say that <clears throat> normally this particular ideal from the Gita is talked about in a religious context of, of enlightenment and it's a, one of the paths that K Krishna offers to Arjun. And I want to, I, you know, I'm interested in discussing it here and now for us in a, in a secular context. And I, my own conclusion is that I don't think human beings, I don't think the ego will shrink that far. So this is really quite as idealistic as Marx's notion of equality. Secondly, I don't think this way of acting, selflessness, we all admire selflessness. Mother Teresa, I mean, who doesn't? You know, she gets a Nobel Prize and all that. But I think we make the mistake in trying to impose selflessness as an ideal in the world because selflessness does not need necessarily to moral action. You know, the defense of the Nazis at the Nuremberg trial was that they were nishkam karmis. And one of the Nazis mentioned this ideal from, from the Gita. I don't know who it was, but one of the Nazi, famous Nazis mentioned this in his trial. And he said, I was not acting for myself. I was doing for the greater glory of the Reich, of, the, of Germany, of the nation. I, he said, I, dis, I hate, Adolf Eichmann said in his trial, Hannah Arendt reported this. She said, it hurt me to kill the Jews. I didn't want to kill the Jews, but I did it for a greater cause. So I'm afraid the Nishkam Karm ideal while it's very seductive, and maybe Krishna, if you can practice 
karma yoga, maybe you can become like that. But it has, it's, a, it's got limited effect. Anyway, there's a lot more discussion on this in, 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 in the book. So, quickly. The Ramayana. Yes. The, uh, you know, the Mahabharata is a dark tale. It's a very dark tale. In fact, I think they needed to write the Ramayana afterwards to give people some hope. <laughs> In fact, the Ramayana had the hero is perfect, the brother of the hero is perfect, the wife of the hero is perfect, even the villain is perfect. Well, no, no, but it's, it's, in fact, it's embedded also in the Mahabharata. But you have to realize, both these epics evolved over 500 years. So the stories were going on at the same time. So just as the Mahabh Ramayana is inside the Mahabharata, there are elements of the Mahabharata inside the Ramayana. So the, you have to, if you look at the scholarship, which I have discussed also in my book, you have to see that. So my point here is that, yes, Parents do not like to teach the Mahabharat in India. They prefer the Ramayana. But the Ramayana, children find it boring to have these perfect people all the time. They love the Mahabharat because the Mahabharat is us. It's about us. And frankly, even the Mahabharat wins in the end, in my view. Through actions, I told you one story of Yudhishthir and the dog, but there are many other stories. I could tell you half a dozen wonderful stories. Why Karna does not switch sides. You know, he's a hero, the, this wonderful hero. He does not switch sides. So let me just lead. Your question was, is to be, between being right and being pragmatic. Well, the Mahabharata comes out on the side that the ruler's dharma is to be pragmatic. That you cannot turn the other cheek if you are invaded by an enemy. You know, there are, we should have negotiations between India and Pakistan. We all want negotiations. But at some point, where do you reach that point? When the next time you have the next blast in a hotel, when do you reach that point when you stop turning the other cheek? So the morality of Gandhi and Jesus are not appropriate for a ruler who has to run a state because there will always be crooks in society. Okay, these are very simplistic answers. But this is what Bhishma teaches Yudhishthira, who in fact is inclined to turn the other cheek every time something goes wrong. And, and finally, the lawyer. my duty. Your question is, what is my, my, uh, my duty? And I'm afraid this one will take us the whole uh, uh, um, afternoon. And... Uh, uh, maybe we should take this after the class. We can talk for five okay, minutes. Okay, so we are... Uh, are we at the end? Yeah, I think we are out of time. Um, uh, so I think uh, we will leave other burning questions. I'm sure there are lots of them to... Uh, uh, you can briefly chat with, uh, with Gurcharan at yeah. the end of I'll this. I'll stay and, here uh, for five minutes also, yes, uh, in case they... Yeah, but he does have to also leave. Uh, but uh, as you can see, this has been a very stimulating discussion. And uh, I must also confess that as a child, when I sat on my grandmother's lap, I found the Mahabharat stories full of these moral ambiguities, uh, stratagems, uh, much more interesting than the Ramayana. And uh, I think that uh, Gurcharan is very right. Um, these things uh, can offer us deep insights into various uh, aspects of the current crisis. Gandhi, for example, incidentally, did have a very dharmic view of capitalism. He had this trusteeship theory. Uh, so he did that. Uh, at the height of the Gujarat riots, uh, Atal Bihari Vajpayee, the Indian Prime Minister, said that Narendra Modi must do his Raj Dharma. So these concepts have been guiding our polity, our economy. And we are truly grateful to Gurcharan for this uh, wonderful act of uh, scholarship 
where he has now broken yet new ground. And I wish you uh, great success in continuing to do that. But I also do wish you would write some more of your lovely plays. Thank you.